You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Elijah Evans from Just Baseball and Future Sox analyzing the draft coming up here in just a little bit on Sox in the Basement. And do not forget to mark your calendars August 9th. Myself, Cherizi E and My Sox Summer from the 108 combining into a three-person panel live before all of you right before the White Sox take on the Cubs. A big party at Cork and Carey at the park. 33rd and Princeton in the shadow of the ballpark. It kicks off at 5 p.m. Do not miss it. This will not be aired. There may be some clips that you'll hear uh, if we gather anything from there, but if you want to check out this experience, we're bringing in guests. It, 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 we're going to have giveaways. Should be a blast. Kicking off at 5 at Cork and Carey at the park on August the 9th to kick off Sox Cubs. Cork and Carey at the park. See more at corkandcarry.com. My friend, you know, I, I haven't talked to I haven't talked to Beef Loaf about this, but I think we're going to ask Cork and Carry at the park to save up all their rotten tomatoes and lettuce from their award winning burgers, just so we have stuff to give away to throw at you guys. While Is you're that up on anything the stage. that anything that's left over, like scraps that came off of somebody's plate, so that you can throw right. them at us because you're jealous that you're not up there? I understand. I get it. No, I no, mean, we're not jealous that we're not up there. We're just looking for something to do. That's maybe all. maybe we'll do an Ed and Beef Loaf event later on. Because the two of you got left out of this, maybe that's maybe that's what we'll do. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. We'll I, have to see if there's interest we'll, in that. We'll, I don't know if there will we'll be. See. But there might, we'll see. We'll see how might. how popular we are. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the White Sox go through the draft. Elijah Evans is going to break it all down for us here in a little bit. I want to talk about the first round draft choice, though, Hagen Smith, because I think that selection, in the face of what we talked about with James Fox, their tendency to look towards high school players, which they did later on in the draft. Uh, and the fact that they needed hitting, you know, the, the perception is the White Sox needed hitting and they needed to have more versatility and they needed to find position players because they are a premium and they are hard to find. Most systems are pitching heavy, a lot of pitching talent out there, hard to find, ready to get to the majors, close to the majors or just high end prospects that are their position players that are hitters. And you would think that's what they were going to do. And instead they go with a big left-handed pitcher out of college. That's so good that he could start next year on this team. Like this could be one of those quick arrival things that we've seen before. Chris Sale got here early as a reliever and you saw Garrett Crochet get here and you could see the same path for this kid or even he ends up in the starting rotation in the back half of next year. Like this, this is a guy who's polished enough Brian Bannister may be sitting there saying, here we go, another pitcher to add into the big mess of pitchers that we have. And I think that selection tells you so much about what this team's overall philosophy is at this moment with Chris Getz. I think Chris Getz realizes his owner is cheap and is going to do something that I have yelled for years that Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams wouldn't do. And that is accept that Jerry Reinstorf is never going to pay to keep pitching around. So you have to attack it as a general manager by going after controllable, good pitching, be so saturated with it that you don't have to worry about him ever having to pay for it. And then you can use the money for position players. And that's what my that was my first reaction when I saw that is we just keep getting richer on the pitching side. We have Brian Bannister. We have all this pitching. This is what we're going to be. They're going to have to spend on hitting, though, with this philosophy. Yeah, no, I, I saw a lot of people who sat there and said, well, Garrett Crochet is, is definitely on his way out because Hagen Smith is Garrett Crochet. And honestly, when I saw a video of Hagen Smith, the first thing I thought of was like, really good Carlos Rodon, not not Carlos Rodon where body parts are hanging off of him metaphorically, but like the one that threw the no-hitter, that guy. I, I had the same thought. He could be here really, really quickly. And you know, he's a guy, I mean, led the NCAA with uh, in terms of K per nine innings, uh, set, struck out 17 against Oregon, which is you know, top team in the in the NCAA. Hagen Smith is the is the goods. At least he looks it. You know, you, you can never tell. But I, I think part of this is too. You know, you mentioned that hitting prospects have been harder to come by because they come up and they tend to struggle. We've seen a lot of that. We get a lot of Ballyhooed hyped prospects and they come up and eh, it's not so great. I mean, you look at Baltimore and Colton Cowser is not great. 
you know, uh, going into this year, the Rangers were all excited because they had Wyatt Langford and then they, they had, um, you know, Evan Carter and they, you know, it's like, we got a couple of young stud outfielders and neither of them have really panned out. And, and it's just, it's all over the majors that way where, where young hitters are struggling. And some of that, there's a thought that they're not getting proper exposure in the minors. They're seeing a lot of guys who are hard throwers and, and these pitching prospects that are all arm and stuff. And they're not seeing guys that know how to pitch to them, and they're not seeing stuff like that. So, Triple A, for example, is worthless because it's 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 like taking batting practice, and and we've seen some of those numbers get inflated. So there's some truth to that. But the other thing is, is that you could field a team of Tommy Fams, right? You could you could field a team of of guys who are professional veteran hitters who aren't flashy, who aren't superstars, and have a really good chance offensively every game to string together hits and steal bases and, and take the extra base and 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 get on without necessarily blowing guys out of the water. But if you have a good pitching staff and if you have a deep pitching staff, you can sustain that. The other thing to remember too is, is that pitching prospects are great, but uh, a lot of them end up getting hurt in some way, shape, or form. There's a lot of guys that get Tommy John in the minors that come out of college or come out of high school and you know they've been overused a little bit or there's something that they're trying to do, something new. They're encouraged to get more spin on the ball. They're encouraged to get a little bit more velocity. They change their mechanics a little bit to try and do stuff, and it ends up impacting their arms. So you've got guys that that you know might need some time there to adjust or might need some time to marinate. So stacking pitching, as a lot of organizations, like you pointed out, a lot of them are stacking pitching. Not a lot of them are stacking hitting. One, you can use the pitching to get the hitting, but two... I also feel like there's a lot more that you can do trying to fill up the positions on the field than there is when you're on a limited budget and when you have a guy that won't pay to extend guys and keep them around than there is to keep a pitching staff together for year in and year out. You're going to have to funnel through a lot of pitchers year in and year out when you're only limited to like Eric Fetty style contracts. The thing is to get the good quality pitchers, you have to give those multi-year things. It's not as much money as he just won't give the multi-year thing. You can get hitters on three-year contracts more easily than you can get pitchers on three-year contracts that are of quality. Like you, you know, if you look at these things, pitchers get. I I feel like just as somebody who's been watching it for the last couple of years, you take a much greater risk and add many more years than you'd like to, and you are paying more uh, AAV, like average annual annual value. For, for pitchers a lot when you're going and getting like that high quality guy where you might be able to find a really good hitter and not have to go that length. I mean, they weren't the best offer for Manny Machado, but they at least were up there around like $250 million. I mean, they mishandled it, but it, I've never seen him even consider spending that much for a pitcher. So he's never going to get the front line guys that come walking out with Scott Boris as their agent. Like that's not what he's going to be able to do. And, and so this is why it would make far more sense if you're a general manager and this is your owner to say, okay, we have to stop even thinking we're ever going to be out there able to get the best pitchers, that number one or number two that comes in there and leads your staff. It's just not something we can do with this ownership, but we can try to develop that. We can saturate so much that if we have 20 or 30 possible guys that could be that, if a couple of them work out, we've found it. Plus, you get capital. I mean, they can overpay in the offseason. They can go to a team and say, look, we're going to give you two two good pitching prospects for this guy here. You know, they can they can wow somebody who who has a hitter that they've identified is going to be a member of their team and it doesn't even necessarily have to be a prospect. They can go out and try to find players when teams are retooling and figure out what they're going to do in the offseason. So it's free agency and also the capital with all the pitching that they have. Socks in the Basement listeners, switch to a new age of life. Keep mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, out of assisted living. Maybe you're getting older. You're trying to figure out how to get around the house. You're afraid that you might hurt yourself. You're living alone. It's all about getting around on your own. Living independently. Stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, even bathroom remodeling, all at Hyatt Home Medical Equipment. They work with your insurance and have 0% financing for qualified individuals. And Hyatt also has the latest and greatest in CPAP machines. If you're unhappy with your vendor, switch now. Get supplies directly mailed to you. 
And if you're down on the south side, stop by the showroom. They have testing rooms and they'll show you all your options you probably don't even know about. They also have the latest and continuous glucose monitors and any medical equipment you can probably think of. See everything Hyatt Home Medical Equipment has to offer at hhme.com. Joining me on the phone line right now, Elijah Evans returns to the show from Just Baseball and Future Sox. He's a prospect head. Uh, a lot of times I just feel like guys like Elijah here just just love the guys down in the minor leagues and can't wait to see all these White Sox players traded so they can see what they get back in return. But uh, to this week, it's great to talk with you, Elijah, because we had the draft and uh, you're the kind of guy I want to talk to to find out whether or not it went well. How are you? I'm doing well, Chris. Thanks for having me on, man. I mean, I'm definitely a, definitely a prospect head and definitely excited for some of these prospects on the way. Um, I was super dialed in the last three days on the draft. I've been kind of tweeting and writing about every single pick the White Sox have made um, in addition to some other stuff. So it, it's been fun. I, I enjoy it. It's a great time of year. I think this is going to be a – it's already an exciting start to it, and then we've got a pretty big two weeks coming up here for the White Sox. What did you think about the first overall pick? Because it surprised me they went pitcher, but as we've been talking about here on this episode – it almost signals they're going to go pitcher uh, deep in their system because it's so hard to find and develop bats, so they'd rather be really good at pitching. Yeah, that's exactly right, I think. Uh, I think that's on the the right wavelength there. I mean, ultimately, I was surprised for sure. I I got a little bit of a tip that it was coming prior to the draft, Um, so I I had an idea and I was bracing myself a little bit that it was a big possibility, Um, but, you know, it's it's complicated, but at the same time, I think what they did was just look at the board and think about the fact that they think Hagen Smith is the best player on the board there. And ultimately, if he is the best player on the board there, you do that and you take that. And that's what's funky about the MLB draft. It's not like basketball. It's not like football. You're taking for talent here. Um, and that's the reality. And you're maximizing within your 20 rounds, you're maximizing the total talent you can get within your allocated slot money. So it's really a complicated situation um, when you really look at the whole draft. But with Hagen, right, like, they were, they drafted Garrett Crochet's replacement, and I know that's not what a lot of people want to hear, but they drafted a guy who will be up next year, if not immediately 2026, but probably sometime in 2025. This is one of the most advanced college pitchers in the past five, ten years, and the guy was just unbelievably dominant all season. Left-handed guy. He's going to get even better when he works with Bannister and the rest of the pitching development staff. He's going to be a stud, um, and if they believe that this is the guy that they're sure is going to be a star major league player – I'm okay with that. And then you go high school with the next two picks and then you prioritize bats and trades, right? And like getting a guy like Hagen Smith, in addition to the system that's already set up with pitching, like you have a really, really good pitching system. Like it's, it's elite. It might be the best in baseball at this point, frankly. And now you're going to have to find a way to trade for some bats. And that's just the reality of it. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to be upset about that yet because I do think there's a really good chance they can get some superstar hitting prospects via the trade deadline. Uh, You and I were talking right before you jumped on, lots of pitching and some high ceiling outfielders, and that was kind of like your take of what they went for, or at least what they went and got. Uh, Overall, how did you feel? Because it sounds like day one, okay, looks good. Day two, what are they doing? Day three, late in the draft, uh, they did pretty well. Uh, Break it down for me. Yeah, very fascinating draft. Um, You know, it was was a weird kind of setup, so... So Hagen Smith first, right? Then you go to two high school guys. You get a high school shortstop and a high school pitcher. Both these guys with a ton of upside. Both are probably going to end up, it sounds to me from, from all indications from Shirley and from the media, that, that those guys, Bonimer and Larson, the second and third picks, are going to end up being overslot guys because they're high school, because they're so talented. They could go to college and get a ton of NIL money. So for those guys to sign at, at the 43rd and 68th picks, it sounds like you're going to be paying those guys a pretty good amount. Um, I didn't mind the first few picks on day two. I think Nick McClain in the third round, uh, big lead bloodlines, brother of Matt McClain on the Reds, uh, the guy that, you know, it seems like a switch hitting, a lot of contact skills, really versatile outfielder, kind of dealt with some injuries, so really hasn't shown his full potential. But I didn't mind that pick overall. Um, fifth rounder, Sam Antonacci, um, I kind of like that one. The, the best Juco player in the country coming off of last year, went to Coastal Carolina, um, had a really good season there. It's kind of that, like, you know, Nick magical light. And I don't want to, I don't even want to say magical because I don't want to put that on him because that obviously did not pan out well, but in the fifth round, getting a guy that has unbelievable contact skills and needs to kind of just, you need to see that at the next level. Like I'm okay with that because the contact skills are so good for him. He doesn't whiff at all. Nothing but just getting on base all the time. Um, That's a guy that I love taking there in the fifth round. If it was the third round, second, third round, I'd be a little more hesitant, but in the fifth round there, I really like that pick. Um, Basically six through 10 were all money saving picks. You go with a senior 50 or catcher in the sixth, three straight relief pitchers, seven, eight, nine, 
and then an outfielder from a small school who was talented, but, you know, it basically six through 10, the entire second half of day two yesterday was picks that should come in under slot at or under slot. I think pretty much all five of those guys should have a chance to go under slot. Um, I really like Phil Fox though, a uh, relief pitcher out of Pittsburgh, ridiculously good fastball metrics. That's a guy that probably can shoot through the system um, as a reliever, as a primary reliever. Um, Aaron Combs closed down the college world series this year for Tennessee, another relief pitcher, but both those two should move pretty quickly through the system. Uh, but in general, that six through 10 was really just a lot of money saving, which at first I was like, what is the, the purpose of this? Because in my mind, Hagen Smith should have been at or even under those high school guys should have been right around slot value. But it sounds to me like all three of those first picks are going to end up being rather expensive. So you had to save some money in six through 10 and they wanted to save some money for the later rounds, which came today. And then today I, I really liked a lot of these picks today, which is, it's funny how that goes. And that's kind of White Sox esque in the past few years. I mean, when you look at the draft right now from the past few seasons, right? You've got guys like Mason Adams, guys like Brooks Baldwin, a lot of these guys that are now emerging as, you know, some of the better prospects in the system that were taken on day three in the past two years. So it's really fascinating the draft strategy from the White Sox. And it seems like it's almost becoming a trend where they really, they work hard to allocate some money towards the early day three picks. And they did that today. Um, you get a few different pitchers that are, that are really interesting, probably relievers, Blake Shepardson and Pierce George, both in the 11th and the 13th. Um, those two guys just, Stuff, stuff, stuff. I mean, really nasty stuff from both those guys. Work to do, command work to do. Probably both of them are going to remain in the bullpen, but just disgusting stuff from both those guys. You get a few outfielders that with some serious experience and some pop. Uh, Nathan Archer, a small school Bowling Green guy. TJ McCant, who was an old Miss guy for a few years with Jacob Gonzalez. Uh, finished at Alabama this past year. Just a ton of experience. Um, you get another hitter in the 17th in Lyle Miller Green, who I had never heard of, but has some absurd absurd power numbers Chris this guy hit uh, multiple over 115 exit velocities this past year um, a small school guy not a ton of pedigree already 23 years old but like total Tim Elko you know draft kit right where like he hits the living crap out of the ball he could easily just you know shoot through the lower levels of the minors and we'll see if the you know he continues to improve right there's still more to do there but a ton of power there um, and then they get some more starting pitching too they, they bulk up on some pitchers that are moldable and interesting um, in the 14th 15th 18th and 19th they go a bunch of starting pitchers just experienced for like you know college starting pitchers uh justin Sin Sinibaldi from rutgers mason moore from kentucky uh, liam paddock from gonzaga nick pinto from uc irvine um, all four of those guys just you know experienced college guys i really like mason moore particularly uh, from kentucky he had an incredible 2023 season struggled this year but getting him in the 15th round a guy that you know could have been a top five to seven round guy the year before. Um, I really like taking that kind of buy low on him. And then, you know, the rest of those arms too are interesting as well. And then you go down at the, the 20th pick, which I'm hearing, I'm trying to answer some, I was just a few minutes ago before we got on, I was answering some questions on Twitter about this because the 20th pick, the White Sox go with the 145th ranked player in the entire draft class, right? So this is a guy that was in terms of talent ranked as a fourth round draft pick. And they get him at 20. So they're going to have to, they're going to have to overpay to get him to come there instead of going to college. Yeah, so it's more complicated than that. It, unfortunately, this is a guy that I would give it about a 5% chance he actually signs with the White Sox. Um, it, it's just the situation here basically is that you, essentially the White Sox organization, and Shirley just said this in a, in a press conference a few minutes ago, but essentially the organization is admitting that they, it's not admitting, right? There's nothing to admit, right? But they're, it's a contingency plan. So getting a high school guy of that caliber in the 20th round, if you don't find him, whatever, it's a 20th round pick, you're burning a pick. It, it really is what it is at that point, And it's minimal money you're burning. But what happens is if you have a hard time signing any of the other guys in the earlier part of the draft, then you have a super, super high upside guy that you could allocate money towards if you have that leftover money from other guys not signing. So the reality is Miles Bailey's committed to Florida State. He's one of the better high school players in the country. Uh, he, he's probably going to go to college. But hypothetically, and this is not an ideal situation, but if something were to happen with any of some of these early, more expensive players that don't end up signing or they can't reach a deal with the White Sox, then you have a bunch of leftover money that you can throw at Miles Bailey and say, hey, we know you're a 20th round pick, but we're going to pay you like you're a third round pick to come to this team to join us. We're going to give you the rest of our bonus money because we want you to come. We want you to play for us and we want you to develop in our system and not go to college, right? So that pick uh, is very flashy and it seemed awesome. Like, oh, 20th round, they finally took the high school kid. Because I, I was hoping, you know, in that six or 10 range, when they were taking all these under slot, you know, senior signing college guys, I was like, oh, that would be the time to, to pounce on a third high school guy. The reality is they didn't think they had enough money. So Miles Bailey is kind of this contingency plan where if you don't sign one or two of the other guys, then you can throw some money at him. 
All right. So there's a lot to take in there, but me listening to you, the way the way I get it is uh, the first few guys are so valuable, they're going to have to spend a little bit more probably than slot for them. They had to then save a bunch of money on day two, but they'd rather go get the guys that they want. And then they also saved a little bit of money so they could have some fun in the back end. And Miles Bailey is there in case anything goes wrong. You can sign him. Or if for some reason, Miles Bailey doesn't care about money and just wants to play for a class organization like the White Sox. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, Chris. Yeah, I know. Exactly. All right. So you look at this class. You listen to Mike Shirley. You see Chris Getz's first draft. You you understand the idea that Brian Bannister is turning this into a very pitching heavy uh, organization, and it's a good thing. and And it looks like the direction is essentially we need to be really good with having arms because we may have to use them in the trade for for bats at some point, and we may have to start spending the money in free agency on bats because we're going to be set with all of these arms. If I told you take a look at this entire list here. And you're not allowed to be excited about the first three guys because they are the first three guys and they should be good. Um, after that, uh, and it was I want to say it was a round one, round two, and a compensatory pick. After that, starting in round three, what guy do you love the most? Who, who if, if somebody sat there and said, pick a guy, pick a guy that we expect to see in the major leagues contributing, and you love them the most right now. Oh, that, that you're putting me on the spot here. In terms of, you know, floor, a guy that I think will become will develop quickly and is a more safe bet to reach than a lot of the other guys i really like mason moore 15th rounder out of kentucky um that's a guy who just has experienced the high level right-handed pitcher he struggled this season but again like i mentioned he came into the year as a preseason all-american right so he was he was looking like he was going to be you know a top a uh, much higher pick than the 15th round i'll put it that way struggled a lot this season came in the college world series and dominated him in his start in the college world series and looked like you know the pitcher that he looked like in 2023 so there's a lot of ups and downs but a 6-4 righty with a lot of stuff natural ability to start clearly can burn some innings like that's the guy that i can look at and say like he could be a starting pitcher um from that back group in terms of like some fun like upside guys um lyle miller green the 17th rounder i think a lot of people are quickly going to fall in love with him um just because there's so much power there um we'll see what happens he's listed as a two-way player he's not going to pitch he's going to be a hitter long term he's definitely got more upside uh, at the plate uh, that's a guy that like i could you can dream on right like that's the one person i think you can really dream on from that back group in terms of like he could be an excellent hitter if things click for him uh, and then in terms of the bullpen guys, there's a lot of different bullpen guys. I mean, they drafted probably six guys that are going to end up as relievers, which is really uncommon, honestly, for a draft. Uh, but Pierce George from Alabama, 13th round, 102 touches on his fastball, Chris. Uh, the guy has absolute juice in his stuff. Uh, could not command all season for Alabama. That's kind of he hasn't gotten a ton of college innings in big moments because his command has never come together. But when you get a chance to get a guy that throws 102 in the 13th round and, and he's looked really good this college and collegiate summer ball or this summer. Um, so that's a guy that like, of all the bullpen guys, that's the one you can look at and say like, oh, that could be a closer if things really click and they can find a way to tune his command up. It really seems like what the White Sox have done here is said, we're going to develop pitching at the at the lowest level, at the draft, and when we pick up prospects, and now we're going to fill in our bullpen too because we're never going to spend $45, $50, 60000000 million on a bullpen again. That is just not the way we're going to do business. It'll be interesting to see what that translates to in the next couple of years. This will be this will be an interesting draft to see how does this actually pan out because it, it did feel different, right? Did you, did you notice anything yeah. that made you feel like, hey, there's a new guy in charge, there's new people in charge of what's going on here yeah definitely definitely different you can feel the banister effect i think brian banister is the director of pitching development you, you can feel the pitching focus and you can feel the focus on pitchers that can be kind of molded in the white Sox form right like we're seeing a lot of this in the farm system right now with guys who are they're, they're focusing on developing cutters they're focusing on a lot of higher velocity guys as opposed to what they used to do right so there's a lot of signs here of like we want to mold pitchers and our kind of pitching development angle right so like that is clearly the strategy here is to focus on the pitching to really nail that guys and then to find a few guys that you think can can become really good hitters and guys that are more advanced as hitters right like they're going other than Caleb Bonimer who's like the the high upside high school guy with that second pick they take right the rest of the bats in this draft pretty much are a ton of experience college developed hitters they're not trying to develop hitters they're trying to get guys who are kind of already developed and they can mold and they can shape a little bit, but guys that are more advanced than their peers, because ultimately this organization has not been great at developing hitters from a young age, right? Like obviously there's a few exceptions. There's some guys that have been great, but 
they are they are trying to take the angle of focusing on developing pitchers, getting hitters who are already pretty developed, and then also getting hitters via other teams that are developing other systems, right? So like you're gonna see at the deadline, like like I'm not saying there'll be no pitchers acquired, but like almost all these trades at the deadline are gonna be for hitting prospects who have already kind of started their development process within another organization that they can then take what they've grown into and kind of get that further in the White Sox system. It, it's tricky. It's definitely not the most standard uh, just track and, and route to take, but I can see it. I, I can see the idea behind it. Elijah Evans is with Just Baseball. Uh, he, he also does stuff with Future Sacks. You're doing so much, man. You're everywhere. Uh, your great Twitter uh, follow as well, or X follow. Uh, uh, follow him, Elijah Ev 8 And uh, I appreciate you jumping on Sacks in the Basement. Uh, I, I hope that you can get some rest now after three days of just following the draft. All right. I am going to get some rest today, and then i got to record a few more pods tomorrow. But I appreciate having me on, Chris. It's always good to talk talk some White Sox. And uh, I'm hoping we're going to see uh, a lot of prospects that I, that I love up in the White Sox, uh, you know, in the bigs in, in a few weeks here. I, I want to bring up something that I think a lot of people missed when Mike Shirley, director of amateur scouting, was talking about Hagan. Because uh, Hagan Smith, like, you know, there's a lot of big things to say about him, a lot of stats. And he said this line, I don't think anybody really got what he was saying here. I have a, I have a theory about what he was saying. Despite all of his success, this is Shirley talking about his new uh, number one uh, or first round draft choice. I was struck most throughout the scouting process by his humility. We believe Hagen to be a foundational piece to what we are building in our organization in the years to come. Now, I don't think anybody got it the way I got it. When I read that line, I thought about a couple years back in that postseason game, you know, the the really exciting one where Larry Garcia ran into one and, you know, it earned him a bunch of money. But, like, the, the, the way that the Astros in that series, like, we kept sending out pitchers that all did one thing. And we have a new guy in charge of pitching development that wants more pitchers than throwers. And I believe that is it would be in any job, I guarantee you there are pitchers within the White Sox organization over the last couple of years and including this season that probably don't like being told they have to change what they do, probably feel really good about what they are, probably just think they've had some bad luck, don't have the humility to follow the program. I think that's what that line means. I think the idea is, look, we want pitchers in here and we want players in here that will make adjustments to their swing, make adjustments to the way that they pitch, learn new things. We don't want to deal with anybody that doesn't do that. And there there have probably been people that have been moved off this team already that don't don't like to listen to you got to change this. And there are probably some more people that are probably going to be gone before we start off next season that are like that as well. That's how I read it when he had that line about humility. Well, and that's an interesting thing because you think about Jacob Gonzalez, who was, you know, the, last year's number one. And how he came in and retooled his swing and is having success in the minors. And, and you know, we know that there were some some things that were changed about him offensively. And there is something to be said about taking somebody who is coachable and, and wanting to do something that becomes sustainable so that you can plug guys in and you can have a certain philosophy and you can mold them into something that you want to do. Now, it remains to be seen if the White Sox will ever come up with a philosophy that actually sticks and works – the ability for Hagen Smith to sit there and say, okay, I'm not just fastball slider, which are his dominant pitches, but I can work on a change up, a split change, or I can work on something new that gives me an interesting facet that makes me into something more. That's obviously one to Hagen Smith's benefit, but two, it benefits the White Sox because then it's a little like Don Cooper teaching everybody a cutter back in the day, right? It, it, it's something that you can sit there and say, look, we can take this guy and we can take him to another level and if you aren't going to pay for ready-made aces, then that's what you have to do. You have to take a guy who is an interesting ace-level prospect with the stuff he's already got, and you got to find a way to build him over the top and make him into something bigger and better, even if you're only going to have that bright, shiny star in your rotation for whatever years of controllability that you have under the CBA. Another thing I wanted to point out before we head out of here, I, I do find it interesting that over the All-Star break, I'm starting to hear more and more from beat reporters like Scott Merkin and even national folks. Uh, after all this fervor 
that Gary Crochet and Louis Robert Jr. were imminently going to be traded. Now everybody's saying basically what we've been saying. They don't need to trade these two guys. They're not trading them unless you knock their socks off. It's like, hey, they're available. Uh, you really have to overspend because we're not in a hurry and we don't have to. And their value may even increase before the beginning of next season or even before next year's trade deadline. And we don't know where we're going to be. So if you want them, you got to spend and you continue to hear reports of, of a team knocking on the door and being immediately shut down. So I feel like this is very similar to the Cease thing. Everybody thought, well, he's got to be traded. But they didn't have to. And Chris Getz has even more wiggle room. I mean, he's got two more years after this season with Crochet and three more with Robert. He can sit back and wait. And I'm starting to hear that now more and more instead of the, oh, these guys are getting traded. I think people are starting to understand that is not a foregone conclusion, and the White Sox don't really have to do it. And and it could change very much so with the makeup of this team and what they are before next year's trade deadline or All-Star break or when somebody starts knocking on the door again. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.